Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. And if you had a story that you could tell a boy of, say, 14 and he'd listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys and young men in the modern world. This series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Joining us on the Understanding Boys podcast today is Dr Zach Seidler. Zach is a clinical psychologist a researcher and leading men's mental health expert. He holds a number of roles, from Director of Mental Health Training at Movember to Senior Researcher at Origin through the University of Melbourne, as well as running a clinical practice. We shared lots of stories today in the conversation, talked about engagement, about what flexible masculinity means, and some of the things that we can do as parents as we raise our boys. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. So joining us is Dr. Zach Seidler. Zach, we we're just joking about the doctor bit just before off, off mic, but um, fantastic to have you with us today. Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. It's, uh, it's been great following your work. It's been great um, getting to, you know, getting to know you. I saw you last week for the first time in the flesh. Um, that was, that was really, really great at the, um, at Spud's game. So uh, welcome. Looking forward to the chat today. Thank you. I'll call you Dr. Ray. It's honorary today. <laughs> it's, only, it's only fair. They're handing them out like hotcakes these days. Yeah, that's right. So I wanted to talk to you firstly and just for our listeners to connect them a little bit into your work. And again, you know, a lot of our listeners, you know, parents, guardians working with um, boys and interested in the, I guess, the mission and cause around, you know, raising the healthy kids that we need for this age, but also um, in the masculinity space. So you operate in a couple of areas. You're obviously a, a clinical psychologist, and so there's work that you do there, um, but also as a researcher. And there's been a few similar people on the podcast, but but tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now and, and even a little bit about why. Like what, what took you into that space? Mm. Yeah, so it's always interesting on, on podcasts like this where I am asked to reflect on how I got where I am and what I do. It's, it's always a... It's somewhat painful to be like, oh God, I have to take it, take a moment to actually consider what my day-to-day looks like, which is typically very strange. And I've created it that way, I think, because um, I never want to do one thing. And I also realize that that dealing with men's mental health more broadly is a very complex problem requiring complex solutions. So um I started out, yeah, obviously uh doing clinical psychology. Um, that was a fun 10-year game. Um that uh, really uh, became it, what became obvious to me. Firstly, I was the only only man in my course, so mm-hmm. immediately it was pretty clear uh, that that I was sitting in a minority um, as a male clinician, and I thought that that was a bit a bit of a problem. Um, and that is not to say I've now done a lot of research showing that that female clinicians are just as good at working with men, but some men have a preference, and they mm-hmm. should have the ability to to work with a guy. And so I was doing that. And then um, I started my PhD looking at the question of why men don't seek help, um, Mm. which really was just following the literature. Um, And what jumped out at me, the the longer I I asked and and delved into this question was that lots of guys are seeking help, um, but they aren't necessarily getting what they want or what they need. And so as a result of that, um, I've, I've now gone on a God, five, seven, ten year journey, um, trying to understand what we are offering um, boys and men across the board when it comes to um, uh, health services, when it comes to education, when it comes to parenting. All of these assumptions that we've had for such a long time around what men want, um, we haven't actually gone out and 
and ask them. And so um, really my work is directly focused on asking guys uh, what works for them, what they need, what they want, um, and creating uh, services uh, that respond to that need um, and that are directly focused on, on uh, you know, positive, healthy, strength-based flexible we can go on forever masculinity um yeah. so that's really uh the the focus of my work now i i work across multiple organizations um the the you know my my home really of sorts is the mustache factory being being november <laughs> um uh and you know i'm so so very lucky um to to be a part of that family um you know that started out largely as a gimmick um and is now a global organization you know we're in multiple countries uh we've got millions of men who are a part of our community and um my my initial pitch to them was really focused on the fact that they keep telling men to open up mm. they keep telling men to seek help they keep telling men to be vulnerable much like many organizations do but then they just hope for the best they they open up this door and then they slam it i think in in men's faces without looking uh, at what happens on the other side. And so I was really, really focused very early on on um, understanding if you tell men to open up, are you actually ready to listen? Mm. Are you ready to respond? Are you ready to hold that space, that vulnerability, that pain, that anger, um, all of these different emotions that that men are showing, or are we just pushing them into a pipeline and and trying to get out a cookie cutter response that that we are, able to actually deal with and so that's really what my work at, at november is focused on it's it's ensuring from an advocacy a policy a research perspective across all of our markets in the uk us canada australia um that if we are telling men to do something we are creating systems and structures that can actually hold them and respond to them and i'm very lucky to also work at, at origin um, at the university of melbourne where i get to do my academic research so I can hold on to the doctor title for dear life because um, <laughs> they're not taking it away from me now. Right? That's it. Yeah, that's it. As a spiel. <laughs> that's great. And, you know, as, as you're chatting there, I'm thinking about the outcomes. So you're talking about, you know, we'll come and it'd be great to explore some of the contextual factors that, you, that you've just outlined there. Um, but but you also said how looking at advocacy, looking at policy, looking at research as, as being these areas that you're trying to land. Um, and there's a degree of complexity and I imagine there'd be a real tension because if I was trying to fund your work, if I was trying to scale your work, if I was trying to take your work and make it available to people, I, I kind of want a cookie cutter approach. I, I sort of want to know, well, give me the top three. I can't do the nuance. I can't do the, you know, so there must be a real tension, um, in that. And I guess that's going back to your opening remarks about, time and complexity where you have a lot to think about you know this is this is a lot to kind of work through and and you know you've given me a very clear sense that you know it's really you know the stakes are really high for you in this like there there's you know this is really really important work this is your life's work mm. the, the stakes are even higher um because of my my lived experience and i don't think that we've you know discussed this before right but my my dad whose name was ray uh took his own life 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. And you know, I often I often say in, in talks like this, because it's really important, I think, to anyone who is listening who has lost someone to to suicide, um, to realize that yes, it is the fire in my my belly that pushes me onwards, but I was already on this journey. Gender has always intrigued me. Yeah. Um and it's it's because of how my dad lived, not because of how he died, that I do the work that I do. He um he was a, a general practitioner. He bought, brought methadone clinics into Australia. Yeah. He um, opened up the first safe injecting rooms in, in Sydney. He was all about, um, you know, equality and focusing really heavily on the most disadvantaged. And uh, m my work over time has been focused exactly on that type of curious question asking, which is like, how is this happening? How are we losing seven men a day to suicide? Um, and what can we do about it? And Yes, the, the cookie cutter response doesn't really work. Uh, and we'll talk about this in a second. But I think the main issue is that uh, individual responsibility has been overblown in our response to uh, the mental health crisis, yeah, right. which is putting all of the responsibility on people's shoulders, whether it be parents, 
children, you know, adults, it, it doesn't matter. It's all saying, this is in your home. This is your issue. Um, and we're not getting very far because if you tell a homeless man uh, in therapy to just change his cognitions, uh, that is not going to get him off the streets. And so we need to look at systemic and structural issues uh, that exist. And that's yeah. where, you know, Movember works in the employment space. We work in the sports and community space. We work in um, in looking at health sectors uh, to understand that it's, and it's also much easier to get men on board when you start to blame the system than when you blame them. Um, and I think that we've gone for a very long time blaming and shaming men for, for what are perceived um, shortcomings uh, rather than trying to get them on board um, and engaged in, in, uh, you know, self-betterment through altruistic intent and, and building things together rather than, um, you know, ripping on the individual. So there's a lot, there's a lot there, but that's where the advocacy and policy stuff can yeah. come in. Um, but the research side of things, yes, I, I still end up, um, and that's because the field is in its infancy still, um, because the men's health sector has been extremely disorganized. Um, uh, it means that I can create programs and, and studies um, that are really, that seem like general knowledge to me, but that are apparently innovative to the rest of the world. And so- <laughs> Can you give me an um, that's example? A, that's a, oh God! Like any any survey we do, we did a survey on dropout, for instance, yeah. from therapy. Uh, really simple question. Um, uh, you know, have you dropped out from therapy previously? Mm. Uh, what were the reasons for that? And you know, we got over forty. It was forty four percent of guys, about two thousand, three thousand guys, who responded saying they dropped out pr prematurely. You know, the fact that that is the first time that anyone has ever asked. What happened? You know, my PhD project uh, was the first time anyone had ever asked guys, what happens to you in therapy? What mm. goes on? What do you like? What engages you? Mm. Um, and so I think that what are perceived as really simplistic, um, obvious questions um, are actually seriously novel in this world because, um, and there's so many reasons for it. We can go, you know, my brain, I go all the way back to Freud and, and Jung. This stuff has been avoided, purposefully avoided. And academia that is that is male dominated in many instances as well, um, that just hasn't looked at these questions for a very long time. So I just shine a light into the darkness. I try to, um, yeah, ask the questions that, that people seem to have thought about but have not asked. Um, and that's why we are where we are. When you were talking earlier about, you know, the individual responsibility being overblown, you know, I was following, I follow you on Twitter and encourage others to do so. And, uh, and you engage in a conversation, I think with Kylie, who we've also had on the podcast around uh, some of the things that are coming out around suicide and some of the factors and causes, and one of them being the relationship to uh, existing or pre-existing mental health conditions. And, mm. you know, that's probably a good example of, of what you're talking about here. Are you able to el elaborate a little bit on that for the listeners? Definitely. So there's a, a lot of research coming out uh, that is trying to understand why the, the male suicide rate is as high as it is. Because if you look at prevalence rates of mental health issues, women reliably are, are three to four times more likely to experience depression or anxiety than, than uh, men are. And when you look at, uh, at the, the, those that suicide, uh, you often do not find a history of mental health issues in, in many of these guys. And so there's a few, and this is where it gets really nuanced. Mm. There's a few reasons for that. There are some guys who are experiencing stuff and haven't expressed it, haven't sought help for it, and therefore are, are being missed and, and lost in the system. Um, and so th there is definitely a subgroup uh, who are experiencing and have probably experienced long-term depression, psychosis, anxiety that were never caught by, by, by our system. And that's something that we need to do better at. But then there's another group of guys who actually have never had mental health issues. If they are attempting suicide, let's be honest, there, there is great distress mm. by all means, but a history of, you know, of a diagnosable illness is not present. And so we start to actually scratch the surface and go, so what is going on? What is happening here that these guys get to this point? And 
what the evidence is showing, and this is what Kylie and I were, were talking about, is that situational stresses, acute crisis moments for these guys being relationship breakdown, so, so pivotal, so important. Yeah. Um, financial distress, unemployment, you know, those, those really key moments in a, in a man's life where their identity gets shaken, where their sense of purpose and meaning gets stripped from them. Um, that's when we have serious risk factors. Um, and so, you know, we need to start embedding um, services and, and responses and interventions at those moments. You know, when a boy leaves school and is going to university, everything shakes up for them. When they leave university and they, they go to school when, uh, to, to work, when they retire, when they have kids for the first time, when they go through a divorce, there are, these are the moments where we need to step in and wrap you know, our arms around guys because um, it is those moments that are actually the greatest um, risk factors for, for you know, suicidality. And so while, while distress, depression, anxiety is the most uh, you know, key risk factor for women, uh, you can look at it, you'll see that, and there's a direct link between that and suicidality. That is not the case in men. Uh, instead, it is those moments where, you know, the six months um, after a divorce, for instance, where things really get difficult with custody and finances. And um, that's, that's, it's these moments where we really need to, these life transitions where we need to step in. So it's these, these situational stresses rather than the pre-existing conditions. And, um, you know, I guess if I, as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking about, boy, like people I know, like the men that I know, um, you know, getting around them during some of these, um, you know, these big transitional moments, you know, you know relationship breakdowns, you know, f- financial unemployment, um, you know, these hugely impactful things on you're pointing to their identity and their sense of self and how they function within the world. As someone listening, if I knew someone like that, what 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 could I do? So there are there are so many different ways that you can respond. Firstly, um, the thing that that lots of men don't understand when they're going uh, about trying to respond to a mate, for instance, who is who is struggling, and something that we try to to promote at Movember is that these conversations don't need to be mental health conversations yeah. that implies that they happen in a dark, scary room somewhere. And you talk in ways you've never spoken before. <laughs> um, just be a mate, do exactly what you normally do, but just do it relentlessly. That's yeah. kind of how I go about, um, you know, if my, if my friend goes through a breakup, I will rock up at his house. Um, and I will, will make clear to him, even though he probably doesn't want me there <laughs> that I am, that I am present. And the thing is, is that, you know, we talk about the ALEC model um, when we're, when we're, you know, we have a, a tool called Movember Conversations, um, which we can put a link to, yep. um, which is really focused on uh, upskilling the general community about how to actually talk to guys uh, in those stressful moments. And the ALEC model focuses, uh, I always think of Alec Baldwin just sitting on yeah. my <laughs> shoulder, but it's um, ask, listen, encourage action and check in. Um, and really importantly, the, the asking and the listening are not solution focused. They are open-ended, let him crap on, let him say what he needs to say, or let him say nothing at all. Yeah. And it is really important that we consider our own discomfort uh, as being something that doesn't need to get in the way of progress here and, and the awkwardness and all of that. It's like, is it your problem or is it his problem? Um, and so, you know, I do a lot of reciprocal self-disclosure um, where I'm, where I'm sharing my own stuff. I do that in therapy as well, which is the best way to show a quality of relationship mm. rather than burdensome one way directionality, which is that instead of uh, me just saying, I'm here to help you, he goes, go to hell. I don't, I don't need help. I don't want that. Whereas if it is friendship, it, if, if it is that connection that you are seeking, it should be one for one. Yeah. It should be a connection where you can actually talk to one another in that way. So the relentlessness is really important because the time and place uh, should be up to them. And um, if you make clear that you are there for them, then they will come to you when the time is right. As long as they know that you are there, um, that's, that's really important. Yeah, I love the relentless mateship. That's, that's fantastic. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, the showing up 
Um, and, you know, as you're describing um, within that, that model of, yeah, just asking, listening, encouraging um, and, and checking in, just being such a great way to, and, and having Alec Bort on your shoulder though, he'd be, be um, <laughs> like a, the devil. The, the <laughs> just devil whispering in her ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As Donald Trump, obviously, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on Saturday Night Live. For those that, um, yeah, yeah. that know the, um, yeah, know the reference. Okay, so that's great. So we're we're talking about these situational stresses. We've been talking about, you know, how it shows up for men, and and we kind of got there by talking a little bit earlier about, you know, that individual responsibility was was overblown, um, you know, in in how it shows up for men. Something else that you've talked a lot about in this conversation is about engagement. And I suspect that part of engagement might lie in the parenting space and in that availability of, you know, and again, another Movember person, Judy Chu and her work around, you know, the relational capabilities of boys. And, you know, what's your take, Zach, on, you know, that, that those earlier years, you know, for parents with, with boys and, um, in that availability and and also in, in engagement, how do we kind of create a fertile ground that boys are going to actually be more more engaged? They're going to get to understand a little bit more what's going on. Firstly, shout out to Judy Chu talking about angels. She is uh, <laughs> she's she's my angel. She's just the absolute best, and her research is incredible. So uh, go ahead and and read her book. Um, but. Most importantly, I think when it comes down to raising boys, firstly, the question people always ask is like, oh, you know, we always ask this in November when we're strategizing. They're like, what population should we be look- looking at? And it's always go earlier, go earlier. Every t- every time you do research, you go, go earlier. We need to get in and understand clinically what is happening, um, you know, in, in four, five, six-year-old boys. Um, the issue with that is parents often, um, which is, uh, you know, that it's, that it's really difficult. Um, again, when it comes to the blaming and shaming, we need to have a dialogue where we can upskill and empower parents, uh, to understand their capacity here, um, to work with, work with their boys to, uh, you know, to, to help them grow into healthy young men, um, rather than freaking them out with everything that can go wrong. You know, there are so many people on Twitter, um, many feminist women who are like, oh, I'm too, I'm too scared to have a boy because God knows what will happen, where that will end up. We need to shift that narrative on its head and just go, actually, look at all the potential. Look at everything that is possible here. Um, and so when I talk to you know, parents, especially around, around engaging uh, young boys, I focus heavily on expectation, uh, which is to say that you need to do your own work as a parent understanding your own gendered attitudes, understanding your own expectations of what a boy or a girl or a a non-binary child uh, should and could and would, um, you know, respond to. So, so there's a lot of um, ideals and stereotypes that are endlessly perpetuated that we don't even realize that we're doing. And so this is the the work that I often do with health practitioners because Mm. You know, you look at uh, those in, in a maternity ward and, and, and the fathers come in and suddenly, you know, none of the nurses will even talk to the man. Mm. Um, and it's like, what is this idea? What is this stereotype you have around fathering, around what, what the man can do in this space? Um, and I think it's the same when it comes to parenting. What do you believe that your boy is capable of? Um, and you need to expect more. You need to expect more from him. You need to expect um, and show him the way um, that there is that there is, you know, endless, boundless capacity uh, when it comes to his emotionality, and fostering that, and catching yourself and apologizing to him and showing him the way when you might, uh, you know, go in the wrong direction and and reinforce a stereotype in in one instance or another, rather than you know, I see that so often where. We jump in, and this is the thing. I, I will often jump in with my, you know, niece or nephew, and 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 go and say something that ends up being stereotypical about their their gender. Mm. And what I'll always try to do, if I'm sentient in the moment, is to respond and 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 immediately try to explain how why that just happened, and and say, you know, that wasn't that wasn't my intent. You're never going to get rid of this stuff. Mm. Full stop. It's a part of our society, but you do need to be aware of it 
And if we can show that type of responsiveness and empathy, action, empathy, um, we're all going to be better for it. So it is, it's role modeling, it's, it's openness uh, to experience and it's understanding your own expectations and trying to challenge those um, pretty freely. So can you give us an example? So, you know, you, bl- you know, you've made a, a gendered blunder, you know, the, about, you yeah. know, sport or, or something like that. I don't yeah. know. You know, what, mm. you know, what would be if something I'm pen- like that? It's, yeah. So it, what, yeah. what would you say? It's, how would you say um, it? it's it's like a, a random response around uh, for instance, if, if uh, you know, your boy suddenly comes out and he's wearing, you know, a tutu or a pink t-shirt or whatever it may be. And you go, Oh, you can't wear that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he doesn't know. And this is the thing. He doesn't, he doesn't know why. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but he's going to implicitly go, oh, there's a link between pink and this, and mm. therefore I'm not going to do that. And so if you can jump in, you know, whether it's five, 10, this is the thing about parenting that people do so often. They go, oh, the train has left. Yeah, I yeah. can't possibly, I can't possibly fix what has just happened. So I'm just going to move on. There is no point where you shouldn't have that conversation yeah, if totally you've realized agree. what you've done. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the point, which is that, yeah, if he's, if he's come out in that, you said, don't wear that. He's gone back, he's changed. You then 10 minutes later can go into the room and have a chat with him and go, I'm really sorry about that. This is why I may have gone, you know, and you do this in an age yeah, centered yeah. way. But um, yeah. yeah, you just go into deep gender theory with a four year old. It goes really <laughs> well. I just want to challenge some of the constructs uh, in my own inner <laughs> dialogue here that, you know, led me to. <laughs> Exactly. The evolution. Yeah, I think that's so great. I mean, the 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 idea that you know, as parents, like we're we're always we, we don't get this stuff right, you know, and and we have, as you say, I mean, the culture and the culture that we live in, the you know, the wells from which we drink, um, you know, they that it comes out, you know, and you, and you hear it and you you're shocked and you, but this it's it's actually a greater role modeling, isn't it, to actually admit that you're wrong, admit that you know, it, it, that you're there's something that you're working with to, you know, the age and depth of, uh, you know, that's appropriate. And I think parents have generally got a pretty good radar for that. Um, and then, yeah. And then talk about it or, or, you know, put it up as, uh, you know, something that's, um, you know, uh, part of the conversation because that then becomes a conversation, you know, it's a conversation about, yeah. um, yeah, evolving, but it is hard sometimes, you know, I get it. Like, cause again, with parents, you, you there is that switch when they, you know, the kids moving from those younger years where they just look up and they, they must think, you know, that you're pretty fantastic and you're conscious that that's only going to last for a little while and then they're going to figure it yeah, all out. You want to hold on to that. <laughs> that's it. I want to be yeah. great just for a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, look, we're all going to find out. I remember those moments when I found out my parents had no bloody idea what was going on. <laughs> and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed reflecting on those. So maybe just... Uh, Maybe just lean into those earlier. I think that that's a really interesting concept as well, though, which is like, you know, that idea that we know everything yeah. is really dangerous um, because it it makes us infallible and and um, and means that these expectations of what they're supposed to be when their parents are really broken also, as well. Yeah, yeah. And when the bubble eventually bursts, it's a pretty big bubble. Yeah, versus yeah. like, oh, he's, yeah, he's little, human just, the whole way. Along. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. It'll still be great yeah. and make, make mistakes. <laughs> that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wanted to talk to you a little bit about, again, staying a little bit upstream. Um, you know, I listening to one of your talks where you were talking about um, male fragility. And I just thought it was, again, as you spoke about it, you used the term a number of times. I've heard of the precarious native, you know, nature of masculinity and, and you know, it's hard earned and easily lost and, um I've also heard of, you know, vulnerability a lot, you know, but your use of the word fragility, I just thought that was so, such a fascinating and it was a bit provoking to me actually, if I'm being completely yeah. honest. Um, yeah. Is it still a word that you feel is something that we really need to take, you know, into ourselves and our thinking about masculinity? Because in one of the stories that you told um, about a, a boy that you'd called Sam um, was that he wasn't able to own his own fragility. I just thought that was such a fascinating mm. thing. And I was hoping you might be able to unpack that a little bit with us today. For sure. So I, I think that something that's really important is that there is a time and a place to use certain language. I yeah. would never use the word fragile with a boy. Yeah. Really, I don't think. Um, uh, so 
there are ways of describing things to a, to an audience, to an adult audience, yeah. um, to a, an academic audience, uh, to explain a concept. Um, and I would then translate that when I'm working with, with him. Um, for instance, the term vulnerability as well, I tend to keep out of my, my therapy space, whereas I write about it endlessly. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a problem that I have now just reflected. I should probably do better at um, clarifying um, is, is, you know, something that should be written about and described as a concept, but should not be um, brought into the room necessarily with mm-hmm. him. Um, so when I talk about fragility, um, especially in, in that talk that you're referencing, you know, the, the question, it was a debate where they were saying, is, is masculinity fragile? Mm. Um, and I kind of turned the question on its head and I said, I bloody hope so. Mm. Um, the more fragile, the better. Um, and I think that that was my, my def and this is where the definition of vulnerability, the definition of fragility need to be questioned, um, because they have been given a bad rap, I think. Um, and that's what kind of my whole approach to men and and masculinities has been about, which is how do we utilize these things that are, that are really healthy, um, and put them in a male centric manner and put them in a strength-based empowering you know, frame for these guys to pick up. Um, and so when I talk about fragility with, with Sam, um, you know, he, he could not access various parts of himself. Mm. Um, and there are so many young guys that I work with who have just turned it off. There is an expectation that they don't have those parts Mm. and that is not the case. They just, it just takes a lot of digging, um, to, find them and that's what judy chu's work is all about which is that you know over time uh the the emotional spectrum just slowly gets eaten away um at you know in young boys from from society on either side whether it be joy or or sadness where you end up with this muted you know anger and frustration in the middle um but there is there is so much to be said for embracing the fragile um as beautiful um and and suggesting really that we should be leaning in to our fragility because it is that uh, very concept that makes us human and that uh, that makes us uh, you know able to to pivot and and grow and develop and you know deal with challenges it's understanding our own weaknesses it's understanding our own shortcomings and how to address them and that's one thing that i don't think men are doing well enough on the whole uh, which is focusing on the things uh, that we don't do that well and and reflecting on how to how to go about you know broadening that out so um you know i often i often talk about potholes when i'm talking about men's mental health um and that is you can go and drive the same route every day and keep driving over the same pothole um and there are so many of my clients who continuously do that and they just shudder a bit you know it's just like (laughs) oh and um and they're like, oh, I'll do something about it. I'll do something about it, you know, over and over again. And then eventually one day it's raining, it's freezing cold. Um, and you drive the same route and your tire bursts. Mm. And now you've got to get out in the pouring rain, pretend that you have any bloody idea how to change a tire. <laughs> talk about masculinity. Spoke and, about um, a true academic there. <laughs> <laughs> these, these hands don't touch. Um, and, Keyboard uh, hands. And exactly. And yeah. now this thing that could have been avoided, that could have been learned, that could have been, you could have taken a different route any day of the week. You could have called the council. Now you have to respond to the crisis. Um, so how can we get men to understand their fragility? And, and understanding your fragility means knowing where those potholes are and, and filling them in or avoiding them um, and, and you know, finding different routes uh, to, to strengthen you know yourself so it's pre-crisis work and for some reason um there's many reasons that we could go into forever you know there's just this this desire to stay away from those those dark recesses of our of our psyche um and and why i am such a great dinner table conversationalist do not ever invite me to a dinner party <laughs> is because I will poke and prod um, all of those, all of those issues with strangers, which yeah. is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because as you're speaking, you, you started off by saying, you know, embracing the fragility as, as a beautiful thing. And then we've kind of got into the pothole, you know, and, and there's, 
I mean, I guess yeah. that also talks to the, you know, where we started our conversation today was about reflection and the complexity of some of these things. Because when you said embrace fragility as the, as the beautiful, I, I just had this kind of image of this, you know, beautiful glass or something, you know, that yeah, it, it's actually, exactly. yeah. And it's kind of a, you know, that's, that's a sacred part of me, you know, that's an important part of who I am and I need to look after that and care for it and have a relationship mm -hmm. to it. And, you know, notice that sometimes, you know, it might need a clean or it might need a this or it might need a that. But then on the other side, there is also the everydayness of life and how the everydayness of life can we go into rituals and processes and things that trigger us along and we don't notice the bump as much until the day, you know, when the bump mm. is really, you know, is much bigger. Yeah. And then we yeah. get into these situational stresses that you talked about earlier and can be real, really yeah. a dangerous place. Mm. I like the mosaic of the glass. I'll, I'll shift it up next time I, I talk about that. Let's <laughs> take that. I'll take that on under advisement for sure. <laughs> Well, I think the other thing that the other thing I took away, you know, from your clarification there was just about, you know, the language and, you know, there's languages for different, um, mm. different contexts and different reasons. And I think um, that's been a bit of a th theme of this chat is that, you know, as parents, what do we choose to share at what point and how? Um, but there's a, obviously a true north on, on being honest and, and being real. Um, but also with some of the other things that, you know, we might understand them in, in slightly different ways as we become more aware or more, uh, I don't know, educated or, um, you know, we have a, a deepening sense of, um, you know, the the event issue or, or context that we're also experiencing. Let's jump into some of the current work that you're doing and, and project-wise. You know, curious, and I think our listeners would be very interested to learn a little bit about Men in Mind. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the work um, – that you're doing there. Again, if I was listening here and thinking, this is great, I'd like to learn more. Um, you know, how, how can people become involved or support? Um, you know, what, what are some of the things that, that we could direct um, our listeners to? For sure. So Movember has a lot of different programs and we're very uh, lucky to have such support from the, from the, the community. So first and foremost, join the, the Movember party, yeah. grow a mo if you can, <laughs> You can't um, put up with your partner growing a mo and and dealing with that prickliness because I tell you it's itchier when I'm dealing with it than, <laughs> than the. But the the uh, the really important thing is that uh, we we see obviously the life course we see the, the complexity of of this and so we respond with with a number of different programs trying to to go to where men are, um, and you know the very the very act of growing a moustache we call health by stealth. Nice. which is that it, it's all a joke. It all looks like it's fun and games, but God, I can tell you the conversations that I have during November are, um, are, are pretty full on. I have to prepare myself well in advance and, and just the amount of, of, of pain and suffering to start with, but also the amount of fragility, the amount of openness that, that comes into this, this community um, through such a, such a, funny event really mm. um, is, is pretty incredible. So as a result, we've got these programs, one being ahead of the game, which, uh, you know, we partner with, with uh, football uh, across, across the globe, really. We we're with NRL in, in the UK, the AFL in Australia, hockey in Canada. Um, and it's really about creating mental fitness and resilience training for parents, coaches and, and players. And so understanding it takes a, you know, it takes a village um, to really get on top of this stuff. Um, so that's one, one program that is hopefully going to be more and more, um, you know, available, um, to, to everyone yeah. within the community. We then have Movember conversations, as I said, which is, um, this conversation starter, it's free, it's online. Um, and it gives you, you know, some tricks and tips about how to actually, oh, he said this, how do I, it's actually literally a simulator of a conversation, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. And you get to choose different, different things. And then we have Family Man, which I think is really an incredible program. Um, the, the vast majority of parenting programs do not speak to men um, and men do not take part in them as a result. And so um, it's, a, again, a free online program you can check out, um, which helps you deal with, uh, you know, pretty tough behavior in, in your, in your children and, and getting you getting that self-reflective ability um, for, for, you know, new dads to, to be able to deal with that. And then finally is men in mind, which is, which is the program that I lead um, 
which while all of those are focused on 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 the guy and the the that individual responsibility to an extent um, or the help giver um, mine is focused on on those systemic issues which is uh, if we are as i said pumping men into a system is the system actually able to respond to them and so um, what my phd really focused on was was creating practitioner training that is psychologists, psychiatrists, GPs, anyone that you're going to come into contact with within the mental health system, um, making sure that they're aware of how distress manifests, what those situational stresses are, um, what to be looking out for, um, and how to actually inbuild masculinities into your way of working. And that requires, we've got a whole module, it's an online training program, a whole module on on you know your own gender expectations and what it means to you, as I said, you know, um, what what parents should do, you know, clinicians should be doing as well. And so um, that's about to be finished up in a, in a research trial. And um, after that, it's going to be free to the world, which is really exciting and um, getting it into as many hands as possible, because these stories, the horror stories mm. that I've heard from, from men across the board um, of going and trying to seek help and then having a horrible, horrible time. Um, that is just a waste of resources, of time, of energy. Um, when we are demanding that men, you know, go to therapy and then we can't actually offer them something that that works. So that's kind of uh, my aim is to make sure that when they go there, they're held accordingly. And the future of men in mind is, uh, you know, that's where the cookie cutter stuff comes in. Uh, at the moment, it's pretty cookie cutter because the one-on-one needs to be taught. Um, but the way that it expands after that is, um, you know, building in stuff for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander men and building in stuff for trans men and all of this, um, you know, doing it justice, I guess, these, these uh, at-risk populations. And then uh, hopefully, you know, creating community um, community resources out of, out of Men in Mind, a shorter program. At the moment, it's, you know, eight to 10 hours, but creating a, a um, flyby, um, flyby night version of it um, for parents and for teachers, um, that is, this is what distress looks like. This is how masculinity interacts with it. This is how to respond mm. because we know that guys are actually going to show depression and anxiety in physical somatic ways, um, anger, irritability, substance misuse, rather than, you know, lying on the couch, eating ice cream, crying themselves to sleep. Mm. So we need to understand the broad spectrum of, of, um, distress in the mental health space. And this needs to be um, offered across the board. So when I have some time, um, that is, that is kind of the aim moving forward is to, to get this into, you know, we've had the police, we've had Centrelink, we've had so many people reaching out saying, you know, I need this stuff because they're on the front line dealing Mm. with these guys and have no idea how to actually respond. Sounds like an incredible, um, incredible program and something that, um, is, is much needed. And, and the, the interest that you're getting doesn't surprise me. You know that that's um, a it's needed and b um, you know it's it's fantastic and uh, something I think that um, many people listening, if you're not already signing up, if you're not involved, following along with what Movember's doing. I think you've just heard uh, you know a, a bunch of programs that um, that really give us, I think, cause for um, you know for for some genuine hope. Zach, what is it to be a good man these days? Oh. The fun one. What is it to be a man these days? Good man. A good man. I drop good. Um, <laughs> Freud I don't like sleep. binaries, man. <laughs> I think that, that that's probably um, probably pretty telling that that I dropped the good because uh, it is it is a constantly vacillating experience. And um, if any day I think I'm I'm good or, or doing good, um, I need to question myself. So I, I think that um, self-reflection is key and is, and is the very reason that no one is ever going to reach this goodness. Uh, just like you're not really going to reach happiness, just like, you know, we, we, cannot, we cannot hold on to these, these, um, yeah, these frames of, of reference as if they are um, something that we should be constantly striving for. But I think what it means to be a man these days and should mean to be a man these days is being able to read the room. Mm-hmm. is being able to be flexible and adapt to the context that you are in. Um, and that means, uh, you know, I, I think that flexible masculinity is kind of my jam at the moment, which is that, uh, you know, positive or healthy are really focused on an outcome. 
whereas flexibility is focused on the process. Um, and so looking at uh, the idea of where am I, what am I doing, and how can I better respond to those around me uh, in order to actually get the most out of myself. Uh, you know, we we talk about, and this is where where we we don't want to dump traditional masculine traits like stoicism or self reliance because in the right context they are very useful. If you are a a fireman running into a fire, uh, you cannot suddenly break down. It's not going to end well for anyone. We need you to be stoic, but we need you to come out and debrief and and talk with your mates and you know describe what you saw and what it means to you. So time and place is is essential here and and flexibility but also say physical flexibility is pretty important it's something i do not have <laughs> um but uh uh you know flexibility across the board and and understanding um that really many of these toxic traits that we talk about in this space and that have been blown up in the media are due to rigidity so it's really flexibility implies um insight it implies self-reflection. It implies going, what is happening right now? And how can I do this most advantageously for me and everyone around me? Um, so there's there's really no goodness, I don't think. There is just um, adaptation and growth and constant desire for self-betterment. Great. And if you had a story that you could share with a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen, what would the story be? And he'd listen. Hilarious. Um, <laughs> So my clients currently, I do telehealth and uh, I have a 14 year old client who uh, the other day, he's just not, he's playing a game very clearly and uh, while on, on the computer. And um, I just got so frustrated. I'm like, I'm supposed to be good at this. <laughs> and he goes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big, that was a big win for him. <laughs> he thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, that sounds like a teacher. Then I, I joined. Oh yeah, exactly. I joined the game in the end. He was mm -hmm. playing. He was playing a uh, an online game, and it was two play. He sent me the link, and we ended up. And God, the 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 intel that I got from him while his hands were busy, and we were both uh, you know shooting zombies was pretty uh, pretty incredible. So that was an, an interesting experience. The thing that I tell them, and the thing that I want parents to tell their kids more, more often, and that I want male role models, full stop, to do, is to not talk about their youth as if it is a foreign long gone experience um because what happens at the moment is that all of these footy players for instance come out and they go i suffered from mental health is issues mm. but i'm over it now or you know when I, I that's totally fine when i was young i was struggling with that stuff as well you are still struggling with it mm. and this idea that young people are uh, somehow just going to push through this thing is an expectation problem uh, that that we are continuing to perpetuate, where instead what we should be doing is telling them how we are still struggling, but what we are doing to survive, um, and you know understanding that there are skills and coping mechanisms that we can gain over time, but that is only going to come from everyone uh, embracing their fragility really, and and realizing that um, this is an ongoing struggle humanity um but it's it's beautiful and it's complex and it's difficult sometimes and it's easier at others and um you know really embracing that flexibility to go i am in i'm in a tough spot right now but but this this too shall pass um and that i will use what i've learned previously um in the in the the future you know context where where i am suddenly offered a really tough situation, um, but I have the skills to, to respond to it. So I'm really, really, I end up talking like Tony Robbins when I talk to 14 year old kids, but I, I really believe very heavily in, in capacity in, in, um, you know, people's potential for change. And so I never want a young person to feel that they are locked, um, where they are and instead show them that, um, yeah, anything, anything really is possible. Zach Sider, thank you so much for your time today. Um, you've encouraged us to challenge some of our assumptions, to think a bit about, you know, flexibility and, and in particular about engagement um, for all the, the young boys, men and young men that we know. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a really, really inspiring conversation to be a part of. So, again, I thank you. 
very much and wish you all the very best for the, the myriad and multitude of things that you do, which are really quite extraordinary. So thanks again. Thanks for having me, Mike. Cheers. We hope you've enjoyed this Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.